When I was a child, um, my parents had one of those accordion folders of LDS art that they used for family home evening and for teaching primary. And I remember looking through the images again and again, unaware of the, um, the lessons that the art was silently teaching me. As an adult, I found that accordion folder and looked through the images again. What I notice now, with an adult perspective, is how women were portrayed in those images. They are on the sidelines, or they are kneeling, they look at the ground, or at the men. They are silent and passive. They are all physically beautiful and serene, and light-skinned. Um, there has been an increase in women's participation in the arts in recent years. Uh, I, my own experience was uh, approximately 10 years ago becoming the art editor for Exponent 2 and committing to have good art in every issue and struggling to find um, that art. And, uh, and now we have more art than we can use in every issue. Uh, I also see it in the LDS International Art Competition. I went through um, past the sort of the archives on their website and counted up names. In 1990, 20% of the women who were part of that con or 20% of the participants of that competition were women. In 2005, that was up to 42%. In the most recent one, 2019, it was 53%. Um, there is good research about what happens when women join boards of corporations or nonprofits. Uh, generally speaking, when there's a single woman, her voice is often ignored and she struggles with comfortably uh, using her voice in a space dominated by men. When there are two women, they are often treated as a single entity with the assumption that they have the same opinions and um, ideas that are interchangeable. It's not until you reach a critical mass of at least three women that they feel comfortable speaking up, disagreeing with the majority, and disagreeing with one another. And I believe that we're reaching uh, that critical mass tipping point for women in LDS art. Um, along with the numbers changing, what I'm witnessing is a change in the ways that women are represented in art. I don't believe that this is merely a simple, direct fact of having more women artists. I think it runs deeper than that. Having more women in the arts is allowing for more complex conversations to be happening within the LDS art community. Women are introducing topics, such as Heavenly Mother, that have been long ignored or taboo. They are creating art. Uh, in which the women are the focus of the image, the center of the narrative, uh, whether it is for a scripture story, LDS church history, or portraiture. And they're looking at women's bodies as complex and diverse, not consistently gentle or beautiful or nurturing. Through this imagery, they're challenging the stories that we all tell about what it means to be female or feminine. Um, as I look at the art coming out today by LDS women, I see a few themes emerge that were not part, a part of the accordion folder of my childhood. Um, so the rest of my uh, presentation will be organized around those themes that I see um, coming up again and again in art coming out today. Um, all, almost all of this art has been published in the last six years um, in Exponent 2. The first category is women's relationships with women. Um, I call this the Bechdel, uh, Bechdel test for art. Um, for those of you familiar with the, the film test, it's this idea that do you have a single conversation that is a woman speaking to a woman about a subject that is not a man? Um, <laughs> so these are images of women without men or children. Um, notice that the focus in each of them is on what is happening between the women. The first is Sisters by Galen Dara, Quilters by Kathleen Peterson. Again, notice the space between the women. This is Crown by Emily McPhee, a slightly darker theme. Uh, you're not quite sure what's happening with this crown. And then Rogues by Louise Parker. 
um, of course, evoking Joseph and his coat of many colors. Next category, portrait, portraits of women. Uh, these are all women's uh, images that portray a single woman as the focus. And not only are women the focus, they are shown with some characteristics not typically associated with femininity. The first is humor. Uh, this is coin op and self-critic, both by Corrine Gerritsen. Uh, both of these take something slightly scary, like maybe making a reckless decision or the self-sabotaging that we sometimes engage in, and look at them with humor. The women here might be doing something dumb, but they are doing it boldly. <laughs> Next is complexity. This is denial and acceptance by Heather Friedas. Uh, this pair go together, and to me, the woman featured here is going through complex processes of facing her own truths and being willing to speak them, and looking at how that changes her. Strength. This is uh, St. Christine the Amazing of Idaho by Sidney Wagner, and What Would You Do If You Knew You Could Not Fail by Emily McPhee. Um, you notice that they stand in power poses, they're looking directly at the viewer, they are unapologetic for the space that they are claiming. Um, Next category is women in scripture and at the center of scripture. While women have frequently been painted in images about scripture, these are a little different from what you may have seen. This is Three Days for Esther, of Esther by Rose de Tocdal. This image tells the story of Esther, um, making her struggle clear as well as her resolution. She is portrayed as both heroic and very human, struggling to make her decision, but full of strength once she does so. Mm -hmm. Enos 1-4 by Kristen Bulich. It's a little hard to see the figure at the bottom, so I, um, I, I blew it up um, so that you can see it more clearly there. Um, there aren't many women in the narrative of the Book of Mormon, and many women that I know uh, find themselves searching for female voices in their scripture study. I love that the artist here simply wrote herself into the story of Venus, writing that at the time she painted her own, uh, at the time she painted this, her own soul was hungry, and she wrote, "We're all Venus at some point." So lacking a woman telling the story that she needed, the artist simply claimed space for herself in scripture. They Listened at the Same Time by Caitlin Connolly. Um, this unifies Adam and Eve, dressing them in the same robes of the priesthood and having them both listening to God and both holding the fruit of knowledge. Every piece of this indicates the equality in which Adam and Eve stand before the divine. And finally, The Armies of Shilamen <laughs> by Molly Hatfield. Uh, Molly Hatfield created this illustration for Exponent 2 about a true story that happened during singing time in primary. When the chorister asked for a volunteer to help with the song, The Armies of Shilamen, um, all the boys declined to help, and the teacher asked Jane if she would help. She stood up, snarled her 11-year-old snarl, and said, I will, but I am tired of all the songs and the stories being about boys. The boys around here don't even take the songs or scriptures seriously. I will help you, but I'm not Helaman, I'm Shelaman. <laughs> well, a humorous story that speaks to how even our young girls are, in the absence of stories about them, simply changing the narrative. Women's History in LDS Church. This is Beautiful Zion, built from above, by our own Paige Turner. Uh, Paige is likely familiar to this group, having participated in the festival multiple times. Her Mormon women, with their falcon hoods and participating in the rituals of early church history, are intricately powerful. Paige's work pays no homage to pioneer women, but also to Mormon sisterhood today. This is Jane by Megan Noblock Gailman. Um, we don't have many artistic images of Jane Man and James. In this one, which uh, was set in a um, real LDS meeting house, 
Um, artist Neville Gaiman uses inspiration from Whistler's mother to create an image steeped in symbolism. Uh, Jane sits in an LDS uh, building there with the burlap uh, walls <laughs> and has a snake underneath her foot and a rooster by her side. The model used for Jane was the artist's former Sunday school teacher, who she said profoundly changed her life. This is Seer Bonnets by Angela Ellsworth. Uh, for this scripture store, a series, uh, sculpture series, Angela Ellsworth created 35 bonnets, one for each of Joseph Smith's wives, women who have generally been ignored in our telling of church history. Each bonnet has a different pattern made from thousands of corsage pins with the needle pointed inward. The artist wrote that these bonnets are meant to become the tools of translation which allow these resilient wives to see messages and translate them into visions. She imagines this community of women with their own visionary and revelatory powers as they pioneer new personal histories. And finally, Pioneer Ancestors by Rachel Farmer. About her tiny sculptures, Rachel Farmer wrote, our ancestors get tired of being so mythologized. They need a little break once in a while to just be human. These pioneer women have all the resilience of the Mormon pioneers, but they are also endowed with Rachel's own identity, a kind of reverse legacy through the generations. The next category I want to discuss is women's bodies. Women are increasingly portraying women's bodies with complexity and some ambivalence. Sometimes women's bodies may be beautiful, but they may also be sources of shame, discomfort, and pain. This is woman put back together haphazardly and woman with a discombobulated body by Laura Erickson Atkinson. These images by Laura uh, may feel familiar to women who have struggled to feel like their bodies were their own, particularly during pregnancy, like the one in um, woman put back together haphazardly. Um, the following images are a little disturbing as a warning to those who struggle with eating disorders or for those here with children. Just a little warning. Uh, this is a series of women's bodies distorted by eating disorders. Lauren uses these drawings to speak to the physical frailty of the body and how the so-called inspirational images found on social media sites damage women's bodies. This is Don't Eat by Stacey Ann Smith. Again, the artist reflects on what it looks like to have a body that is regularly in pain, uh, this time for a woman with celiac disease. The next category is the divine feminine. Um, as poets, writers, and theologians are increasingly bringing Heavenly Mother into open conversation, LDS women artists are also imagining what a divine feminine would look like and what her qualities would be. This is Mother is Wisdom by Erin Collette. Uh, the artist uses traditional symbols of mythology to give this wise mother the attributes, grace, judgment, faith, wisdom, and power. Oh My Mother by Heather Rutten. This version of Heavenly Mother is to me more conventionally Mormon in that it is a very relatable deity. Uh, you can imagine it being a counterpart for many of the Heavenly Father images we have in LDS art. This is A Mother's Love by Lind Mott. Lind Mott's painting emphasizes the maternal and won the A Mother Here art contest from 2013, which wrote at the time, how can women ever envision themselves as divine beings, as gods equal in every way to male counterparts if Heavenly Mother almost never gets depicted or even mentioned in Mormon discourse. This is Blue Madonna. I love this mosaic. It's just a coincidence that's another blue-faced divine feminine. Um, but I love that she has this aura of power around her. Women of color. I'm not going to say much about this because Michelle has an amazing presentation she's about to give on this subject, but I do want to highlight three images. 
Um, this is My Relief Society by Karen Dudley. About this image, Karen wrote, looking around my ward one Sunday, I longed to see sisters that looked like me, varying shades of mocha, brown sugar, caramel and honey, full lips, coarse dark hair. It was important for me to raise a black daughter who could see herself in many varying shades of life, leadership, and success. She couldn't find that through LDS media, so I decided to create some of it for her. <coughs> this is Ruth by Esther Hilalani Kundari. And My Prayer by Kwani Povey Winder, which was on the cover of the most recent issue of Exponent 2. Um, in an effort to encourage and amplify the voices of LDS women of color artists, Exponent 2 has started an annual brand. Uh, the recipients of the grant this year include Elizabeth Sanchez, Esther Kandari, Hannah Choi, Marlena Wilding, Kwani Pobi Winder, and others. And if you're interested in being a part of this grant, please contact me as we're hoping to grow it uh, coming into the next year. The last category I'm discussing today is non-binary people. Artwork by LES people exploring queer identities is a new development, a conversation um, that, frankly, Mormon feminists are just uh, starting to understand um, and take part in. The Shadow Side of Belief by Sidney Wagner. And Am I Not a Celestial Being by Eliza Cross. This image by Eliza Cross is particularly powerful to me. The person portrayed is dressed in white robes, has a saintly circle around the head, um, both significant symbolisms. The gold leaf obscures identity, but also indicates royalty. Um, as more women enter the LDS art world, they are not only speaking up in ongoing conversations, they are actually changing the conversation. They are, in questioning the attributes, they are questioning the attributes that are traditionally associated with femininity. They are writing themselves into narratives that excluded them in the past. They are not only placing women at the focal point of a conversation, they are allowing women to be fully human, complex beings navigating their own faith journeys and struggles with mortality. And I, for one, am excited to see where those new conversations head. Uh, Paige Turner and I, uh, the art editor of Exponent 2, decided to start an Exponent 2 art Instagram community. This is a space where we thought we could better connect with LDS women uh, that are creating artwork and to expand our network of the LDS artists that we were including in Exponent 2. Um, as Margaret had mentioned from earlier experience, that wasn't always easy and we had found ourselves often trying to rely on artists that we had built relationships with, but it wasn't necessarily representative of the, the breadth that we have in the community. Um, and since starting this platform, we've grown to a community of more than 800 followers, with the vast majority of those followers being women artists. That's really who we're focusing on attracting, and we're really using it as a networking tool in that space. Um, and building this community on Instagram has allowed us to diversify and increase the number of artists we feature in the magazine. Uh, we generally publish around three to four new contributors each issue. Um, and to show a little bit of a sampling of the artists and artwork we found exclusively on Instagram and then published, um, all of these artists that I'm going to show could be considered early in their art careers, and many of them this was a first time publishing opportunity. We have a cover by Sarah Moe, the most recent cover by Kwani Hobie Winder. A photograph by Jacqueline Schumante. This piece by Elise Well. This is by Sarah Ashley Peterson. A piece Margaret showed by Eliza Cross. This piece by Cheryl Crockett. Anastasia Larson. 
Brittany Susie, and recent BYU graduate Megan Mitchell Arne. Instagram has emerged as a new marketplace, and Mormon women are seeing the benefits. In preparation for this presentation, I led an informal survey of Mormon women on Instagram using Instagram to administer the survey. <laughs> In it, I asked the very basic question, has Instagram impacted your career for the better? In the 2017 survey, Art Marketplace and Valuable found that nearly 56% of U.S. consumers between the ages of 18 and 24 said they would buy art online, and 45% said social media is the main way they discover art. Speaking broadly, Instagram offers artists a way to take on the role of artist and dealer, establishing profitable, profitable businesses as confident entrepreneurs who produce, market, and sell their own artwork, bypassing traditional art world intermediaries. On a platform like Instagram, artists can communicate with clients, build an artist network, search for new art world trends. They also curate their accounts like a virtual gallery space where artists can exhibit their work to a global audience unburdened by high real estate and maintenance costs. Here's a look at the curated Instagram feed of LDS artist Heather Rutten. Really gives you a sense for how they're seeing this as, as a gallery-like space with a consistent look. Here's another one by artist Megan Trueblood. And this is artist Melissa Kamba, a, a shot of just the top of her Instagram feed. And you'll see in these highlights, she has her upcoming shows, prints highlighted for sale, an in-depth look at her gold leaf process, and then she's advertising things like worldwide shipping, showing that she sees this as a, as a global platform and marketing broadly, and a place to contact her for commissions and a link to promote her website and her body of work. In my response to the sur in the response to my survey, one obvious artist said this: "There's a freedom in publishing on Instagram without the traditional gatekeepers." So, what does this freedom look like, and how are Mormon women utilizing it in their art careers? For many Mormon women, this means the flexibility to pursue an art career while working from home and managing family responsibilities. When I asked women in my survey, "What is the biggest challenge you face in your art career?" Many responses centered around juggling the roles of artist and mother. One respondent replied, professional association and recognition is critical and has been elusive for those of us at home. I'd like to highlight the work of Denise Gasser as an example of an artist who is utilizing Instagram to excel in this space. Denise is an LDS artist living in Vancouver, Canada and is pregnant with her fourth child. She's been building an art career for over a decade. Five years ago, she began working on an art project that speaks to the tension that exists between what she describes as her vital roles as artist and mother. This series is made up of five by seven panels painted in a single sitting. She describes the project. For each panel, I painted without stopping until I was either interrupted or managed to finish. Often, my stopping point was the moment I could not possibly continue painting through the interruptions. At that point, I stopped working and did not allow myself to revisit the piece. On the back of each painting, I documented the start time, the end time, and the interruption that forced me to stop. The duration of each painting ranges wildly from under two minutes to over two hours. The subject matter is inspired by the scattered fragments of daily life with my children. And here are some close-ups of a few of her pieces. Boys are begging me to play zombie tag. They just did bubble gum in a dish and determined that I'm it. <laughs> Three-year-old has been working on a secret recipe and is now on the counter ready to plug in the <laughs> She only made it for 40 minutes. On it's late, desperate for sleep. Just needed to prove to myself that I can still make something. 
After a couple years of coordinating the project and her ideas, she decided to explore what social media could do for this series. Social media was new to her, and she enrolled in a course organized completely on Instagram with a prominent Instagram artist named Emily Jeffords. Jeffords teaches mentorship courses on building our careers online and social media. In Gasser's words, this class changed everything for me. She began documenting her experience as an artist and mother on social media under the title of Art After. Her experience of creating art with kids at home became part of the artistic narrative, and social media was the vehicle for chronicling and communicating her experiences as artist and mother, and within a year she had grown to 3,000 engaged followers. She said Instagram really opened up avenues to embed her own personal narrative into her artwork in an authentic way. In particular, she says, I learned the power of sharing my unique story. I held back for a long time because I didn't know if it was professional. Denise recently displayed her art after series in Vancouver at a gallery space she rented after several failed attempts working with galleries in the area to have them show the series. So she self-funded the gallery display and ended up tripling her investment in art sales. She had three women she had never met before travel to Vancouver to see her art show in person after they had been following along on Instagram for several years. She sold artwork in the US, Canada, New Zealand, and Germany within her first 48 hours. In addition to the flexibility of working from home, social media is giving Mormon women a space to pursue and fund entrepreneurial artistic endeavors and to network, in particularly in niche LDS communities and feminist circles. A great example of this is the creation of the artist book Woman Crowned by Amber Richardson and Anna Killian. This is a forthcoming artist book that pairs writing with compelling photography of biblical women, such as Esther, Vashti, Bathsheba, the Queen of Sheba, and more. The book aims to connect the reader with the many rich traditions surrounding Heavenly Mother. Amber and Anna first encountered each other on social media, where both were active in Instagram spaces that featured conversations about Heavenly Mother. Both had been pursuing different artistic projects surrounding the Divine Feminine, and Anna reached out about a collaboration. Social media acted as an inspiration hub for sourcing content ideas and poetic inspiration about the subject matter. And when it came time to produce and fund this series, Anna and Amber turned almost exclusively to social media to spread the word about their Kickstarter campaign. Traction in artist circles and shares from influential Mormon women with a social media presence made all the difference in achieving their marketing objectives. They raised $27,000 in 30 days. Richardson said to me, you take social media out of Woman Crowned, and Woman Crowned no longer exists. She described the artistic freedom that social media provides beautifully, saying, social media is a market of ideas, and it's totally free, which references the cost, but also the liberty of it. I am completely free on my Instagram page to share questions that I may not be able to in a Sunday school class. These exciting examples of social media in action also bring up both a caveat and a question. The caveat is an acknowledgement that Instagram lends itself to certain types of art more than others. For example, it's hard to capture installation or sculpture well on Instagram. Scaled and detailed images don't play really well in a mobile-sized space. I also find myself with lingering questions regarding diversity and access. While it is true that Instagram cr creates space for women without traditional representation or financial backing to form flexible and successful careers in the arts, the question remains, is this resulting in more LDS women of color and disadvantaged populations pursuing careers and finding success in the arts? I'll share a few quotes about the advantages and challenges in answering this question about diversity. Melissa T. Kamba says, we place value on fine art in our society. And by painting women of color, I can show that we are valued. Instagram has definitely helped me share this perspective. No revolution has ever begun without art. Elizabeth Sanchez says, seeing other Latina and minority women paint, write, and successfully create on social media empowers me to continue with my art. But another survey respondent shared a difficult perspective, saying, I feel like Instagram has helped me find a community of artists and other creatives, but I feel like white LDS women mean well at times, but women of color LDS women artists know there is really no space for us with them. 
Social media is a key place to try to reach diverse audiences and those who have often slipped through the cracks in LDS art circles. I believe these artists have much to offer the LDS art community as we work towards a body of LDS art that matches the diversity of our global membership. Lastly, I'll touch briefly on the idea that for many artists, Instagram is about community. This is best summed up sharing a few responses from my Instagram survey. Using the most sophisticated Instagram survey techniques, I asked the question, <laughs> as an artist, support for my Mormon peers means this much to me, in which respondents got to drag <laughs> the hard eyes face as far on the spectrum as they wanted. Um, I also asked a question that forced artists to choose between the benefits of marketing and community in a space like Instagram. So is it more about marketing or more about community if you could only choose one and you'll see the community overwhelmingly won. Illustrator Megan Spears Max said, it started out as marketing and still is. The community came later and it was unanticipated. That has been enriching and a huge blessing. Artist and author Ashley May Boylan said, Instagram reminds me that women will show up for me and I for them. It gives voice. An artist, Caitlin Connolly, said, community. It means connection, hearing each other, seeing each other, loving more fully. Social media is having an effect across the art world, and many Mormon women are turning to these spaces, and particularly Instagram. To sum up some of the exciting benefits and impacts, I'll point to three things. First, social media empowers Mormon women in a private space to have a public voice. In the words of artist Elizabeth Sanchez, Instagram has given me a louder voice from the comfort of my home studio. It doesn't matter if I have an accent, or I'm wearing the same t-shirt three days in a row, or if half of my day is spent nursing a baby. Secondly, it allows more women to enter the artistic sphere, diversifying what it means and looks like to be a Mormon artist. In the words of Michelle Fanzoni Fanzon Thorley, social media is powerful because it will be the medium in which many stories and perspectives of women and people of color will be heard for the first time in history. And lastly, social media promotes discourse and discovery about the nature of femininity, motherhood, and what it means to be a Mormon woman. As Amber Richardson says, my social media community allows me to publicly explore and, engage, and create more deeply than I might be committed to in other religious settings. Not all art is to be sold. Some serves to generate discussion, and I think women on social media are generating important discussions. I believe there are infinitely more opportunities for artists who learn to advocate for themselves and their art. And I'm grateful that social media is giving women the freedom and that LDS women are grasping this opportunity. Thank you.
It still humbles me that this force, which made leaves and fleas and stars and rivers and you, loves me. It's amazing. I can do anything and do it well. Any good thing, I can do it. That is why I am who I am, she said. Yes, because God, God loves me and I am amazed and grateful for it. Growing up, I would look um, at Mormon art and feel connected to it as a follower of Jesus Christ, but I never saw myself represented there. While this image is not LDS, it is an excellent representation of the images I am referring to. None of the faces looked like mine. They did not tell the stories that were mine. I often wondered to myself, where do I fit in here? As a Mexican-American, an only child and a daughter of a single mother, I often felt I belonged nowhere that was looked upon positively. I do not fit into the stereotypes of Mormon, and I often wonder, would there ever be any art that would represent my experiences in the church? Even though I have little education, I felt called to paint because I love how diverse our church is, and I want everyone to know that they fit in and have a place here. I did not see the art I wished to see, so I decided I needed to make it. <clears throat> Why is it important that women and people of color create art? First, I want to acknowledge the term people of color represents a large, diverse group of people. While our experiences differ, we are almost all minorities in our societies, and especially in the church. In a recent TED Talk, actress America Ferreira said, I want to play people who are complex and multidimensional, people who existed in the center of their own lives, not cardboard cutouts that stood in the background of someone else's life. I have witnessed the power our voices have when they can access presence in the culture. We cannot deny it. Presence creates possibility. I share that quote because it really hits home. Why is it important to have diversity of skin color, gender, ethnicity, and background in LDS art? First, let me ask you, what is possible for the future of our church? What is divinely <clears throat> designed for the future of our church? It is diversity. But how can we create diversity? We can create diversity by building the possibility for it through art, by anticipating and planning for it. This is Christ's church, and we all need to be represented here because we all belong here. We are starting to we are starting to see more representations of people of color painted by white LDS artists. While this movement is wonderful, it is only the beginning of inclusion. A recent study conducted by the Public Religion Research Institute showed that 91% of the average white American's closest friends and family members are also white. This study demonstrates the deficit in understanding the lives of people of color, and therefore the inability to tell and paint the stories of people of color. We have come to a place in history where people of color don't just want their stories told. We want to tell our own stories, dreams, and perspectives using our own voices. We do not want to be the background color in someone else's painting. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, Elder Ulysses Suarez said, when we understand people and their circumstances, we tend to act in love. We tend to embrace them according to their needs. This is all about ministering. You minister to people according to the circumstances they are living. And we have to understand their challenges and difficulties. I believe diversity is very important. We should learn from the different ways people are and the different ways people think. We cannot empath empathize and minister to people's needs if we do not understand their circumstances and stories. Throughout history, it has been widely researched and documented that women in general are the most marginalized and often oppressed group in history. This mar marginalization is magnified even more when you add in race. All women, and especially women of color, understand opposition. As minorities, we need to be able to process, express, pray, and create art that is based and inspired by our own distinctive life experiences. Minority women have unique experiences with oppression. 
Our histories and experiences, our stories have been pushed into the shadows throughout all history. I get both excited and emotional when I think about women working out and sharing difficult life stories through art for the first time. <clears throat> a year ago, while working on my family history, I had a difficult time dealing with the atrocities my European ancestors inflicted on my indigenous ancestors. For many people of color, family history involves oppression, racism, slavery, and violence. It is really hard and depressing to confront these things. I was able to sit and paint as I worked out my feelings about this difficult subject. It began with a lot of anger, then a deep sadness that I felt in my bones. I understood that this violence, racism, and oppression has lived in my family for centuries, and that I still felt and saw the effects of it in my life and the lives of family members today. By doing family history and temple work, I was able to work through these difficult emotions and express my feelings on this process through painting and begin the healing process that my ancestors and I have longed for. Having our art match the diversity of our membership also helps our community by sending a message of inclusion. This painting is Jesus Said Love Everyone by J. Kirk Richards. Imagine if you were someone who was LGBTQ and wondering if you would be safe and welcomed into a Latter-day Saint church building. How would you feel walking into one of our church buildings for the first time and seeing an image like this? I would hope it would be a step in the right direction to help visitors feel welcome without using words. In preparation for this talk, I looked for a painting that would demonstrate a feeling of inclusion for women of color. It was very difficult to find. This painting, Morning Hosanna by Rose de Tocdal, a Filipina American, is very uncommon which is sad to me because this is exactly what we need to see more of. Our walls should send the message to each person who enters that they are part of the body of Christ and that they are seen and loved for who they are. Why are there so few artists um, of color in the LDS community? For me, beginning to paint was a daunting task. I had to first believe in myself that I could teach myself how to paint. I had a palette knife and two, two tubes of paint. I was lucky enough to be given some used paint and brushes until slowly I could buy a few of my own supplies. I taught myself how to paint portraits using tutorials on YouTube. It took months and months to understand what I needed to do and get the supplies. I would watch painting tutorial after tutorial, and then at night after I put my kids to bed, I would try to imitate what I had seen. I had to guess on colors and values since I didn't and still don't quite understand all that. I had a lot of discouraging thoughts and feelings and little guidance on how to improve. It seemed impossible, but I did not want to give up. You may wonder why there are not more LDS women of color artists, particularly oil painters. While talent is universal, opportunities are not. Lack of educational opportunities and money to buy supplies are very real obstacles. The cost of the investment in resources is often too high for minority women who often struggle on the edge of poverty in our society. Food, bills, and medication are always going to come before painting supplies. This all becomes more daunting when you add in the confines of motherhood. Becoming a mother has been a huge artistic inspiration, as well as helping me to become a better version of myself. The connection between mother and child is so inspiring but I would be untruthful if I didn't also acknowledge the difficulties it brings. I started painting when I still had two preschool-aged children at home. There was never time to paint unless I stayed up very late at night painting in terrible lighting. Finding a place to paint was even more difficult with the solvents and chemicals that go with oil painting. And finally, the ultimate difficulty was making the decision to focus my emotional and physical efforts to painting and not focusing 100% of my efforts on family and all the tasks that mothers are responsible for. It is not just that my house was messy, it was the difficulty of forcefully making time for my dreams and then dealing with the guilt that came along with my decision. What should the community do? 
We need to find more ways for mothers and minority women to share their voices and unique perspectives to enrich our church and to be able to empathize and minister to a variety of people. Social media is, a, is powerful because it will be the medium in which many stories and perspectives of women and people of color will be heard for the first time in history. Social media is a great way to find mentors and seek out guidance and opportunities. It is also one of the few ways for minority women to find and apply for monetary help. Even though through personal experience, I know there are not many resources out there for people like me. Providing scholarships and grants to help with financial obstacles will be the first phases for those wanting to help. The continuing phases will be filling our chapels and church buildings with a diverse selection of art, a selection diverse enough to shine a light on the most marginalized people in our society. We need art that represents the difficult circumstances that our sisters in the church face, told by the very sisters that have overcome those circumstances. I want children that look like me or have had experiences like me to grow up seeing themselves in the art of the church. Media and the arts have been influencing social realities for centuries. Let us make art that reflects the future inclusion we want to see. If we make it, they will come. I understand that we all suffer in different ways. I want any women or young girls listening to know that I pray for your successes. You are my sisters. I know that God loves you, that he sees you, that we see you, and you and I are more than our stereotypes, and you and I are strong and capable of any good thing. Thank you. is interesting um, you know for a long time it, like hashtag LDS art kind of reigned and now you, it, it's, it's interesting it's like representative of the divided community you'll still see kind of hashtag Mormon out hashtag LDS art you'll see the full name art <laughs> um, at the end and uh, so you kind of have to keep in mind on all those different spaces one thing that I notice um, you know so so when Paige and I are sourcing art on Instagram, we're definitely following those, and it's a, it's a source we use. You, you have to use those tools to, to find others that are reaching out to you by using those tags. But there also is um, definitely a lot of LDS artists that haven't necessarily um, decided to market themselves in that way. Um, you know, so they will they're using social media to market their careers, but they're using other types of phrases to attract attention or different types of hashtags. And that's something that Paige and I have been really interested in. Was, it was a motivation for starting the Exponent to Art Instagram community, was to set an example that by using phrases like hashtag Mormon Woman Artist or hashtag LDS Art, um, hashtag MoFem Art, <laughs> um, and you know, whatever it is, that we're kind of trying to set an example that, you know, that other artists can consider whether that is a part of their identity or a market that they want to be a part of or if they want to own that space and kind of by seeing it seeing those hashtags being used then it kind of opens up that possibility which allows more discoverability within the LDS community so Michelle could you also maybe speak to women of color identifying with hashtags well, on social media broadly Instagram 
I, I don't know too much about hashtags, but it's just finding each other. You know, like for me, I live in a mostly white community, and so just finding other women that this art resonates with or who have had the same experiences that I've had that we'd never meet or find each other if it wasn't for social media. And that um, is so powerful, like, especially when I can paint about something, for example, this painting of losing a child, um, and then connecting with those people on that hope that they will see that child and hold that child again. And people from all over the country, all over the world, and it's so empowering and um, beautiful. Any other questions? Right when people know, they know this is this is a home for me. Like I feel welcome here. I, I feel like that would be so strong. And I visited a couple chapels and where they have broken from the mold and they have like a unique art piece in there and just how beautiful it is and special it is. And I know like they uh, the church does that with temples where you know the, the temple is very unique to the area and the art usually also. Why can't we see that more in our church buildings? I would add to that that I think this is going to be um, a process of, of art sort of coming into different buildings um, before, I think the meeting houses will probably be the last um, buildings to get this art. Um, I'm seeing things in like the, the DC Temple Visitor Center having events in which they're featuring this kind of art. Um, the LDS art competition this year had um, as I said, many women and several people of color. Um, like Michelle said, that even the temples are gradually getting some of this. Um, but we have not crossed that barrier of, yeah, having the widely distributed, um, you know, sort of the images that go into widely marketed church publications or you know are sent to the church buildings to be hung up on the walls we haven't crossed that and i i'm hoping it's just getting to the tipping point of being in those other places we finally get to uh, to the meeting houses thank you all i am wondering if building community is such a big um, goal for us as female or women, wherever you are on the gender spectrum identity. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if there are maker spaces or diverse maker spaces or places that we can gather in community with scholarship for those who have issues coming together um, in travel. But are, is there something like that that exists for artists who are, who are making about this topic? Like in person? Yeah. Because art is such a, it often feels like such a solitary journey. And you're in your studio day after day creating. And to know that there are other people making this kind of art is a really powerful uh, community to have. Yeah, that's a beautiful idea. I, I know there's a huge proliferation of Mormon women's retreats across the country. I know some of them are dabbling in artistic um, events while they're there, but I, I don't know of anything that is specific to Mormon owners. So, yeah, I just think that's why social media is such a big space. Yeah, I mean, it, it's for now, I think it's filling that space. The, 
interacting in person and locally, you know, would, would be wonderful, but it, that community definitely, you know, exists, and you could, probably could speak more to, to what that means, but that was just reinforced again and again. I really thought that that slide was telling, where it was, you have, you can choose marketing or community, you know, as an artist, and it was like, well, if I have to choose one, like, community is what I wouldn't give up. We can take one more question. So, logistical question, would you each share your Instagram account so we can all follow <laughs> Sure. Um, uh, well, I only have a personal page that I share pictures of my kids, but she's you should follow the Exponent 2 Art yeah. Instagram. That one, that, one have. that one you have? Yeah, with two eyes. Yeah. So, Exponent II Art. And my uh, Instagram account is called Flora Familiar or Flora Familiar at, on Instagram. So. And within, you know, that's part of what I think Paige and I are just really proud of what we've been able to create on the Exponent 2 Art account is start there. We're tagging every artist that we're featuring in the magazine. And you'll really start to, if you're wanting to get into the Mormon woman art world, that's a great space to start. You're going to see the community there, see the, the you know the artists in that space. So start there. And with Exponent Two Art, you will always um, be notified when the next issue is going to print. So um, <laughs> you know to subscribe as well. <laughs> Thank you all.